afternoon and welcome to another episode of Condo Insider. Uh, my name is Jane Sugimura and I'm your uh, host for today's uh, episode. And uh, today we're going to have a you know really interesting uh, discussion with uh, Senator Sharon Moriwaki, uh, who uh, is going to be talking to us about what happened in the 2023 legislative session uh, that just recently ended uh, and about what condo bills passed and didn't pass, and maybe some of the reasons why. So stay tuned. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Senator uh, Moriwaki. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure always, Jane. Well, thank you. And, you know, we're going to start the conversation. I mean, and we, we didn't have uh, too many condo bills, I mean, which was probably a good thing, although we had some of the usual characters, but we'll talk about them at the end. But, you know, let's talk about Senate Bill 729. And this was your bill. And it and it called for the the Real Estate Commission to set up a curriculum for boards of directors. And I think the original bill talked about owners as well. And this was your bill. So why don't you tell us what made you decide or what was behind you, you uh, introducing this bill? So, you know, my district is very condo dense. I think it's the most condos in, among all the districts. And so we have a number of complaints coming in about um, typically one owner against another, an owner against the board and uh, the owner against the property manager. And, you know, condos are self-governing. And so we try to try to mediate that, but there is law and they do collect money from the real estate commission to do training, to do mediation. So um, we've heard about, you know, from a number of uh, um, residents, condo residents or owners who want to eliminate proxies to the board, have term limits for the board, uh, an ombudsman bill, uh, so that they can resolve these disputes that really should be sort of more amicably <laughs> resolved and haven't been. So um, in looking at, at the, the problem, it really boils down to who is the decision maker in the condo. And it really is the board of directors. And you, all the condo owners, elect these people. And uh, if they are volunteers, which they all are, um, they may be teachers, they may be plumbers, they may be, you know, um, people who are not trained in running a multi-million dollar corporation. So the idea uh, for this bill was to train owners and and board members uh, about what this what they what they own in terms of you know the condo is is not a single family dwelling unit where you just you know you 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 have control over everything. Uh, you deal with um, your neighbors. All your neighbors are part owners of your property. So um, so the bill started off that way: training owners, training condo uh, board members so that they know their responsibilities, which is a fiduciary one because they get elected to represent all the members of the association. My condo, 310 units, uh, and they represent everybody. So they have to look out the best interest of the whole condo and and what's called fiduciary duty. You, you have a very real responsibility. Plus you should know what the condo law is because it's a very different animal than others. And you should know um, all the rules of your own condo. So you've got bylaws, you've got uh, uh, your uh, house rules and ways that you operate. So the idea of this bill was to have uh, a training program so that board members and owners would know what they, they deal with in, in this new living arrangement, which is a joint, jointly owned uh, property that we all own and we all take care of. So, um, so that was part of it, and then the the board. But you know, one of the let me just point out one of the the, the 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 triggers I think that started all this. There was an issue with one Archer Lane that came to you that was came to your attention. In fact, mm -hmm. it was in the media. It was on the newspapers. It was on TV, and this was a situation that happens. I mean, it's not uncommon. You have a group of homeowners who claim that the board of directors blindsided them by making approving a special assessment for doing structural repairs to the building, right? And they said it was a total surprise and 
they came to you because they wanted the legislature to do something about their board, their their awful board who did these bad things to them. But then I think what you have to do in a situation like that, you know, because a decision to do a special assessment, especially in the one Archer Lane situation, didn't happen overnight. There were meetings, there were town hall meetings where the, where the owners were invited to attend. They were told they were going to talk about structural problems. And some people did not attend. And some people didn't attend board meetings. But when, you know, and after all the discussion and the meetings, you had structural en engineers telling the board of directors that unless they did the, these repairs, they're building the, the, the structural uh, safeness, the safety of their building was in jeopardy. And so under the Hawaii law, the board has got to take action. Otherwise, you have a situation like in Florida where the building collapses, right? And, and, and in Hawaii, the board can make the decision to do a special assessment. In Florida, that board, the, the, the Florida law did not allow the board of directors to make a special assessment. That's why that decision in Florida dragged on to the point mm -hmm. where, you know, the boards were not empowered to make the repairs and the building collapsed. Mm -hmm. But in Hawaii, we don't have that situation. But what happened at One Archer Lane is the board after all the months of talking to experts and trying to have town meetings and inform their owners had to make the hard decision. And when they made the hard decision, you had a bunch of homeowners who got really angry. And I think you know the whole purpose of your bill was that both sides have got to be communicating with each other. You, you cannot have because you know the, the, that uh, situation showed that it's not one sided. There's two sides to every issue. And yes, the homeowners, you know, felt put upon because now they have to pay this huge expense. But, you know, I guess if they had participated in the process, it wouldn't have been so painful. I mean, it was going to happen no matter what, because they didn't have the money in their reserves to pay for the repairs. So long story short, they would have had to do a special assessment one way or the other. But the problem was that they weren't talking to each other, or at least some of them weren't talking to each other. Yeah, and, and I think that you bring up a good point is that you live in, uh, you know, a, it's a, a community, it's a communal interest, right? So you do have to talk to each other and the board is responsible for talking to the members or the members coming to board meetings and, and reading the documents um, as well. So, so I think it's a joint responsibility of everybody and you pick a board, um, just like you select legislators, uh, to represent your best interests. So um, so I think it's that kind of training that we look for in in um, the Senate Bill 729, which passed, which I hope the governor will sign into law because it does, it got watered down because I really did feel that, that we should have had the board being certified by the association. At least I went through some training. I know what the law is. I know, you know, what my rules are in my, my, my um, condo. But but without, without that, at least what we have in this bill is that the Real Estate Commission, which collects money from each unit owner every other year, um, has money for training, that it should develop the curriculum for board training and, and other training. And I know the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs has programs like this already developed, so it's pulling it together uh, for, board, for all the board um, members to really review that and the documents uh, that I think we can have a better functioning, not only board, but the association and, and happier people living in condos. And some of these are huge. So you really do need communication and better ways of working together and living together in, in, in the condos. And, and, it was your, and I think I, I heard you say one time that the reason for one, this bill too is to you know, train these volunteer board members who probably don't know how to manage uh, a multi-million dollar, you know, building in right. terms of taking care of the repair and maintenance of the structure, plus trying to oversee, uh, you know, implementation of rules and regulations so that people, you know, in this community, uh, you know, it's like a mini government, it right? Is. It is. It's like a mini government. And, uh, and, and we thank the legislature for, 
at least acknowledging self-governance and allowing the condos to do self-governance. But what it means is that that means that the owners and the board have to kind of work harder because otherwise they're all going to come rushing to the legislature to say, oh, you got to fix it. You got to fix it. But if, if you keep fixing it, after a while, we're being regulated by the government. Yeah. Right? That's the true. Governance goes away. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't think people would want government to be regulating how they live, <laughs> you know, yeah. ultimately. Right. And it's only when you have a few people who have a problem or many people who have a problem come to us and we say, OK, we're going to make this law. And now it applies to everybody and everybody suffers because now we're regulating yeah. the, the owners of the condo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, That's I think it. this is a very important first step. At least the real estate commission is going to have to develop a curriculum. And, you know, there's, you know, like my group, Hawaii Council and CAI and the various property managers, we all do board training. So this is going to help us because it's going to at least focus us on what we have to do to train, do board training. The only good, because you only have a lot of segments like the ones we're doing, but you actually have fiduciary, what is fiduciary do? What do you mean by a reserve? Uh, and how do you have to man manage uh, the operations uh, of of the condo. So I think they're all very important, very important segments that you have already developed. So it's pulling that together for boards and for uh, condo owners. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and one of the things we wanted in this bill, which got mixed, uh, because they thought there was a liability and board members having to, uh, or not, not wanting to um, become board members and volunteer, uh, when we said you had to read the law. Well, I would rather not have a person volunteering who didn't know the law running my multi-million dollar building. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it goes two ways that that really, if you're taking on a board, um, a board um, a role, uh, then you, it's your responsibility to know the law and to be able to on the best interest of everybody living in your building to take good care of it and to know what the law is. So I think it's it's that thrust that we're we're really trying to see. Everybody has a stake in this, but if you're going to be a board member, um, you know, you, you should take it seriously. Right. I, I and I agree. And I think that in you know, if everybody did that, it might alleviate some of the issues we have with the owners. Mm -hmm. And then by the mm -hmm. same token, you know, the owners have an obligation, you know, as a owner in, in the building, if they care to attend, not every board meeting, but, you know, some board meetings. And especially like in the one Archer Lane, where, where there's a notice posted for town meetings mm -hmm. and they tell you we're talking about structural repairs to the building. I mean, I don't know about other people, but if I saw that notice in my building, I would be attending because I know you're talking big bucks. Mm -hmm. You're talking big bucks, and, and I know that if you're talking about the building, and I'm an owner in the building, I'm going to end up paying for it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I would make sure that I was at that meeting to at least hear what was going on, you know. Um, and I think most people, if they understand what's going on, and nobody wants to be in a situation like the Florida collapse, where that building, you know, just collapsed, and I mean, there was your investment, and some people died. You know, nobody wants that. And and, and so um, I think that uh, uh, if, you know, we were able to at least, you know, get some of the board members more interested in learning and, uh, you know, knowing what their responsibilities, then you've succeeded. You really have. You really have. And I congratulate you for, you know, doing the hard work to get this uh, bill passed out of the legislature. Okay. Well, thank you for your support on this. And, and you know, it's still not all the way through because the governor has to sign the bill or at least not veto the bill. So right. I would hope that your listeners um, and those watching will make sure that the bills that we do um, we do talk about today and others that they're interested in seeing become law, that they have a responsibility as well to go one step further and let their voices be heard by the governor so he, in fact, will make this become law. It is almost law, but not quite. Right. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. The next one is Senate Bill 855. And this one, you know, it, it amended the uh, budget and reserve section. 
mainly because, you know, the city and county of Honolulu passed this uh, fire safety ordinance. Mm. And what it did, I mean, one of the unintended consequences uh, was that it, it made things more expensive for older condominiums, especially those condominiums that didn't have fire sprinklers. Right. And then at the same time as the fire, as the these buildings are in Honolulu are dealing with the fire safety ordinance, you have an insurance problem. The reinsurance, which and the, the two are not connected at all, because the insurance problem is happening because the reinsurance companies that supply the money, you know, they cover claims for the local insurance companies. They had their, they suffered all of these losses. I mean, you look at the world. You look at the wildfires in California. The condo collapse in in Florida, the floods in in uh, Europe, the floods in, in in the mainland. It's all covered by the same reinsurance companies. And over the since 2020, they've suffered losses that are in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And so, what do they do? They got to recoup their losses. So they raise their premiums mm -hmm. to the local carriers, and the local carriers pass it on to us. And mm -hmm. so. Associations are shaking their heads and saying, what did we do? How come this is happening? And the answer is, it's nothing you did. It's because of other conditions around the world. It has nothing to do with Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But we still have to pay, just like everybody else has to pay. And and so, like, my, my billing, the insurance went up $35,000 in mm -hmm. 2021, uh, 20, and 2022 went up 65000 That's over and above, I think, the 12% that we budgeted. Right. And so and, and you know, I, I heard, you know, some people couldn't even get hurricane insurance without spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this was not, you know, in, included in their budget. So, you know, you know, there are there have been all these challenges. And now because of the fire safety ordinance, the budget, uh, the budget and reserves section of the 514 B was revised to include the you know having to include the uh components of the fire safety uh ordinance which are not cheap right you know and and i think it's really important that this change be made so that it's before you have the problem so that you're you're preparing ahead of time because as as you know we we're discussing even with the one archer getting a special assessment is like buco bucks at one point in time versus planning ahead and knowing, okay, I've got to spend, even if it's $10 million in 10 years, I can deal with that over time uh, to make sure that at the time that I need the money to make the repair, I have the money without another special assessment um, so that your maintenance fees may have to go up, but if going up 3% or 5% and putting it in this reserve uh, is really important because again, planning ahead for major expenses like you're talking about, Jane. I mean, you can't do it in one year. And right. sometimes it has to be because, you you know, the, the contractor is not going to take money over 10 years. Right. They want the money up front. So it is problematic if we don't plan. And, and the law now requires you, when passed, an uh, actual sign, will require um, to have an independent reserve, not a reserve pre preparer, so that you do have you know, the facts before you as much as right. can be. And you know, this is another instance where the board is going to have to talk to the owners because we're not talking about cheap. The fact that, you know, it's being put into this statute and, you know, about the board has to consider it and is setting aside more money, it means increased maintenance fees, just like you said. And so what you cannot have is unit owners saying, hell no, we're not going to pay. That not, yeah. That's just not the right attitude. Because this is stuff that's required by the ordinance, and it is for safety purposes. And most of the older buildings, the fire alarm systems are just hanging together on a wing and a prayer. I mean, they're, you know, <laughs> right? Because I know ours is like all Band-Aids, you know? And, and, and so it's in, in need of serious, you know, uh, attention. And, you know, so, you know, people have to understand with older buildings, it's not cheap, and it's going to cost them much, bucks. But they have to do it. Otherwise, you're, you're jeopardizing your safety and the marketability of the most valuable asset you probably have. You know, because 
what what good is it of, of you know how are you going to sell it if you're not mm -hmm. taking care of it and um but um you know so this so this is a you know this is a, a big concern you know going forward and this is it ties into your bill 79 about the board and the owners talking to each other Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, and and you have to look at this as you're lucky you 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 have two hundred other people helping you pay the bill. Yeah. <laughs> so you really need to be eyes wide open and 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 think of it this way. Look at look at uh, Marco Polo. They didn't have that, and the, you know, and and that fire went through, and people were displaced, and it was a tragedy, right? So so if you look at that as the the worst case scenario, it's better to plan forward to prevent that versus right. being stuck with it at the end and it's too late and you lose lives, which, right. you know, is really a tragedy. Well, before we get to 1509, I, I told uh, 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 Benjamin Sullivan, who's with the state of Hawaii, that I would make an announcement. And so okay. we're going to see something scrolling, on the, something called benchmarking. So all of you high rises, there's a, a state law that says you have to benchmark your utilities and your water. And your reports are due to the state of Hawaii. The deadline is June 30th, 2023. So if oh, that's right around the corner. Right around the corner. <laughs> so if you haven't gotten your act together, talk to your property manager, your managing agent, and tell them, ask them, where's our benchmark report? And are you going to submit it to the state by June 30th, 2023? I'm told it's a computer program. It doesn't take more than an hour to install onto your computer. And then you get your uh, information from HECO and Board of Water Supply. It uploads and then it can be forwarded to the state of Hawaii. But you what gotta happens if out. you don't do it, Jane? Do you know what happens if they don't do it? What's the penalty? Well, there are fines, but since this is the first year, I was told that they, they, they don't anticipate doing the fines. But, you know, I was asked to make the announcement because we had a special program on benchmarking and what is it? But the report is due June 30, 2023. It's right around the corner. Talk to your site manager or resident manager. And if they give you this blank stare, then you better uh, tell them that uh, to check the law, it's a state law benchmarking of uh, utilities and water. Your the, uh, the report for your building is due on June 30th. Okay. So make sure you don't June let it 30. slip. Mm -hmm. But you'll get a notice from the state of Hawaii as to where's your report. Okay, now we're going to talk about 1509. And this is this is not so complicated, but it's the common interest development. And, you know, there's three laws in Hawaii. There's 514B that deals with condos, and that's quite a substantial law. I mean, many, many pages. And you have 421J that talks about planned community development and 421I, which is co-op. And 421I and 421J are very small. They're only a couple of pages. And so there are people who have contacted me over the years to say, how come we can't get a subsidized mediation like the condos do? And why can't we do RICO complaints like the condos do? And so the the whole purpose of of this is this bill is to, to set up a task force, basically, right? So that the 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 stakeholders can meet with the DCCA and tell the DCCA what parts of 514B they want, right? So that they can then come to the legislature and say next session, okay, we're gonna amend, because I guess the consensus was, because one of the things of that bill was to make one law to deal with all the different types of common interest developments, but that kind of hit a brick wall. I don't think anybody was rushing with that. <laughs> no, I think that was... <laughs> we got enough problems just by 14 B condos. Please don't add to our problems. <laughs> so, so, so I think it it, it 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 morphed into something. Okay, we'll set up a task force, and 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 the stakeholders can look at 514 B and make a list and work with DCCA and say, okay, we want this portion, we want that, we want this and that, and then DCCA is going to make a a report to the legislature so that you can expand. 421J to include wow. those provisions that makes more the sense. statute, right? Yep. And with, with the con good. yeah, with the condos, I think they're 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 just uh, uh, setting up a task force uh, to um, basically review some of their procedures to see if they can make things better. 
Yeah, and I and I think you know it's been many years. When was what? When was uh two thousand and what uh, that the condo law was passed by fourteen B? But it's been over 20, 30 years, right, Jane? So, so the new one B, it, it, I think uh, that came it? about in twenty sixteen. Oh, only twenty sixteen. Okay, because yeah, because that's when that's when they they uh, separated out separated them out, and, and for a while we had two of them. 514a and 514b and then there was it was a two-year mm -hmm. period they said at, at the end of the two-year period 514a was going to go away and that was in 20 i think it was 2016. okay so i i'm looking at you know i think it's it, it really governs us well but you know it could be clarified and certain certainly um looking at what some of the dispute um resolution kinds of um I mean, it's very general in the law. It says the real estate commission uh, shall provide for uh, mediation and it shall do training, but it's very general. And I don't know if we want to get that specific, but but looking at the law and says, does it cover everything that some of um, some of the condo owners are complaining about? Does it need to be revamped? And I think that's the idea that it's the focus is really on these community um um associations and co-ops that don't have the protections and the governing structure that uh condos have and they want to see what of it can they can they um learn from and and include in this but but there's also while we have that uh those task forces asking the task force to maybe look at 514b should there be more duties um uh to be placed on board members um or should there be any kind of um more information or more more regulation of how you do dispute resolution i i think those are kind of the areas where it's been um friction in the condo arena that maybe this would be a good time for for those who have problems to to turn it into the task force so as you're looking at uh the community associations and the condos here are some things to think about in terms of whether we revise the the law or not and that would be very good for us coming back next session to see what um what transpires from the task force yeah and you know we only have like a minute left but you know in that time i wanted to uh, address this you know there's the concern about the ombudsman bill which didn't get much traction in this session and and you know and maybe at least i'm an old timer i can and 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 you know and I was talking to you know uh, some of the, your colleagues in in the legislature when th those bills were you know being considered and I reminded them about the condo court and some of them mm -hmm. remember that we, in, in 2024 through 2027 there was a condo court in the DCCA and there was a hearings officer and if a condo owner had a complaint they filed it with the DCCA they got a hearing before the hearings officer, no rules of evidence. You didn't need a lawyer. You just went in and basically told your story. The hearings officer would answer questions and make a ruling mm. on the complaint. The problem with that is because of the rules that were in effect, it was an administrative hearing. If you didn't like the decision, you could appeal it to circuit court. And then when you appeal it to circuit court, I mean, the whole purpose of the, the mm -hmm. process was to, to, to come up with a process that was cheap and fast. The minute you go to circuit court, it becomes slow and expensive, right? Which is what we wanted to avoid. And, and then the results came, were mixed. And William Sparrow was the lead uh, uh, legislator on that. And I was working with him. It was a one year with a one year bill with a sunset. And I talked him into extending the sunset because I said, you know, Senator, one year isn't enough time. So he extended it two years. So the whole bill was in place for three years. And by year number three, everybody wanted it gone. The mm. owners hated it. The associations hated it. The attorneys hated it, mainly because the rulings, you know, the, the people who were making the decisions didn't have a clue about condos. I mean, they could look at 514B, but if you don't have the experience, it kind of taints the decision. Even the owners were unhappy. Mm. And especially when it got appealed to the circuit court, I mean, and then you get mired in litigation, and expenses. I mean, it was not what was contemplated by anybody. So it went mm -hmm. away. And I reminded people, that's what happened. So mm -hmm. do we really want to go back and revisit that? That's what the Ombudsman Bill is all about. Yeah, and I do, I do want to 
jump in on just one thing. You know, we feel that the condo world is is the world, but we are a small portion of, of all the state's living arrangements, <laughs> I must say. So when we, we try to pass some of these bills, there are very few of our colleagues have interest or you know know about it. And so when Jane talks about a hearings officer or even maybe a judge, unless it's he's or she is dedicated to condo a condo court, um, the law is different. The the the, the whole five fourteen B is a different regime. So you really do need people who have history, who know what it means, and and um, it's not it's not uh, just regular. Um, landlord tenant law or housing law it's it's a, an animal of its own that was created for the self-governing not to have government and in, government interfere too much we can we can take care of our own in our our own uh condo or living arrangement so so it is different and so when you talk about having an ombudsman or having a hearings officer you you really do need to have uh, a person that really understands condo law and has history, you know, in terms of how you resolve problems in a community living arrangement. Right. Well, and anyway, I think that that's the response I have to people who want to know how I understand that. Yeah. Ombudsman, yeah. you know, Bill never had any traction. And because there were a lot of people who remember the condo mm -hmm. court and all the complaints that, mm -hmm. I mean, why would you go there again? I mean, it's done that, been there, done that. And so, anyway, We've run okay. out of time. Thank you so much, Senator, again, for being with us. We always have always such a pleasure. <laughs> oh, interesting conversations. Okay, and please uh, tune in. Oh, just <laughs> remind everybody these three bills. Please um, write to the governor if you like them, because they really do need to have the governor's signature, or at least not be doing the bills. They're all good okay. bills. Okay, listeners, pick up your pencil or get on your computers and write to the governor. But anyway, thank you for being with us today. And please join us next week for another session of Condo Insider. Aloha right. and mahalo. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.